to the Health for the World International Grand Rounds. We are honored to have our Grand Round speaker today. Our Grand Round speaker is Dr. Purvi Parwani. Dr. Purvi Parwani is an assistant professor of medicine, cardiology at Loma Linda University. She earned her medical degree from Gujarat University, Ahmedabad, India. She received residency training in internal medicine from University of Connecticut, cardiology at the University of Oklahoma, and advanced training, training in cardiac imaging from the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, Dr. Parwani is passionate about cardiac imaging, particularly cardiac MRI and echocardiography. She is the only early career representative on board of society of cardiac um, MRI. Her imaging interests include inherited cardiomyopathy, including hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and women's cardiovascular disease. She's a renowned educator, and we are really honored to have her for her grand rounds today on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Thank you so much, Dr. Parwani, and you can start whenever you are ready. Thank you so much for inviting. I'm really honored um, to get this opportunity. So without any delay, I'll uh, start sharing my slides since we have a long way to go. Okay, very good. Are you able to see my slide? Yes, yes. The slide is excellent, yes. Very good. Okay. So inherited cardiomyopathy um, are the cardiomyopathies that are caused by the genetic uh, disease of the heart. And as you all can see, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy makes a significant portion um, of uh, these cardiomyopathies. Um, and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it's caused by the myocyte deray, which causes the left ventricular hypertrophy. And this phenotype is manifested in different hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So what we'll discuss today is definition of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, kind of take you through the deep drive um, uh, through hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, um, walk you through the guidelines American of American College of Cardiology, as well as the European Society of uh, Cardiology, and then um, show you the cases where the imaging highlights, um, um, imaging importance highlights. So um, looking at the definition, one more thing, what I've done is for all the educational points, I've, I've put a, um, a tag of teaching moments and uh, you will see it as it comes. But I think those are for trainees that have uh, joined the presentation. Uh, probably those things are important to remember. So if we look at the definition of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy um, in adults, it's the LV thickness more than 1.5 centimeter in any left ventricular myocardial wall as uh, measured by any imaging technique. Um, it's important to remember that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the most common genetic disease of the heart. It's transmits, transmitted in autosomal dominant fashion. The overall prevalence is one in 500. So it's rather common disease of the heart. And it's the most importantly, it's the number one cause of sudden cardiac death in young adults. So again, these are um, a few of the things that I want all of the trainees particularly to remember. And uh, for the uh, trainees um, uh, taking the American boards, actually, this is what, these are few of the questions that get asked um, both, or, both on internal medicine as well as cardiology boards. So what is needed for, to make the diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is left ventricular hypertrophy in any pattern and what's not needed is obstruction. I feel like uh, trainees make these mistakes quite often where they think that for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the diagnosis of obstruction is needed um, since the, uh, the whole disease was identified as hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy in the, um, in the past, um, but that's absolutely not necessary. And I'll walk you through some um, or some uh, data, but uh, basically almost 30% of these patients are present and not in non-obstructive pattern. And if we look at the important differential that we often come across in these patients while making the diagnosis, it would be hypertensive heart disease, um, cardiac amyloidosis, or aortic stenosis that has uh, led to um, uh, the left ventricular hypertrophy. So these are another teaching moments to remember that obstruction is not needed 
for making um, the diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and almost 30% of the HCM will present in a non-obstructive fashion. So when we look at the genetic, um, um, uh, uh, genetic profile overall, this is from the um, European uh, Society of Cardiology. There are so many uh, mutations that are, that are identified, but the most common we need to know about um, that cause the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy are the MYH7 um, and MYBPC3. Now, one thing I want you all to remember is that um, five to 10% of uh, these um, uh, mutations uh, would cause inherited metabolic or neuromuscular dis uh, disease. So the ones that uh, we come across most often is the glycogen storage disease, um, the commoner one in the, um, in the adult population was, would be uh, um, uh, lysosome storage disease, um, the Anderson febre disease. Um, and then uh, Friedrich's atrexia is an important one from the neuromuscular uh, disease to keep in differential. It's uh, important to remember that amyloidosis can cause LVH, um, the, both the ATTR, AL amyloidosis, as well as the senile wild type, which is quite common um, in the senile population. Um, and last but not the least, least um, drugs like uh, hydrochloroquine, uh, hydroxychloroquine, steroids, and tacrolimus are, are responsible for LVH, which can be confused. Um, and this again makes a board question. So remember the drug induced hypertrophic cardio, hypertrophy um, of the left ventricle, particularly the hydroxychloroquine, um, which is. Um, gotten some attention since um, COVID-19 has started. So this is again from the guidelines. So when we look at the diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the, obviously the clinical evaluation comes first. Um, however, the imaging technique advance, um, our first evaluation always starts with history and physical, um, getting a family history of the patient, the sign and symptoms, the EKG, and um, then comes the cardiac uh, imaging. And then guidelines are uh, put very nicely uh, when to consider the genetic genetic testing, um, when to get that multidisciplinary uh, input, um, et cetera. So when we look at the history and physical examinations, particularly for the trainees, age is important um, uh, for the diagnosis. Um, now, it's important to get the thorough family history, the, the history of sudden cardiac death, history of any unexplained um, uh, congestive heart failure, um, history of um, cardiac transplantation, if any, um, any history of ICD implantation, why and what. Um, and then symptoms, uh, you know, it's important to remember young patients particularly may not have any symptoms or may have very few symptoms or their symptoms may be completely masked and they may be be overcompensating uh, for their symptoms, but the patient that are symptomatic um, can have angina, shortness of breath, uh, palpitations, uh, syncope and presyncope. And I put this table again from the guidelines to kind of give you the idea uh, about uh, those five to ten percent, the metabolic um, as well as the neuromuscular. Um, uh, L, uh, causes of LVH and what it may present, um, what signs or symptoms particular disease may have. Um, so as we know, um, sensory neural deficit um, is a common one with the mitochondrial disease as, as well as the lys lysosomal storage disease versus for something like uh, amyloidosis, carpal tunnel syndrome is a very common um, association um, with um, uh, LVH. So when we look at the prognostic profiles, um, some of the patients may have benign or stable longevity and may not um, undergo um, this whole manifestation of um, cardiac symptoms, um, the AFib or the end-stage um, uh, cardiomyopathy or heart failure or the sudden cardiac death. Um, but I think that it's important to elicit um, all the signs and symptoms, ask the patient uh, what symptoms they may have. So 
if we look at the physical examination, the most important thing probably I want all the trainees to remember is the systolic murmur that um, typically is heard on the left sternal border. It's increased uh, during the uh, maneuver, so um, that decreased the preload, so particularly the Valsalva menu maneuver. So these are the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is probably one of the other um, uh, the other disease that causes um, increase in murmur on Valsalva along with uh, mitral valve prolapse. And uh, again, um, a, important to remember that hand grip maneuvers or anything that increases the afterload will um, uh, will um, will uh, decrease this. So here is the murmur. Okay, so I think that um, if we look at the um, entire, sorry. Okay, so if we look at the entire spectrum of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, um, um, some patients at rest may have um, more than uh, 30 millimeters of mercury um, uh, obstruction. Um, the non-obstructive type would be the one where uh, at rest you don't have an, uh, any obstruction or the obstruction is less than 30 millimeters of mercury. But uh, when you physically provoke the patient with Valsalva, it still remains less than 30, meters of, uh, 30 millimeters of mercury. Labile obstruction would be something which is um, at rest less than 30, but when uh, physically provoked, it would go more than um, 30 uh, millimeters of mercury. So these are the categories uh, by which <clears throat> prob you'll probably categorize the patient on uh, echocardiography. And I'll go through what this means. So on the echocardiography, um, we not only identify where exactly um, is the LVH, what the pattern of LVH, but particularly uh, try to identify what is the gradient across the LVOT um, that is present at rest. And then we perform the Valsalva maneuver and try to repeat this under dy dynamic condition. And this is what um, it refers to. So this is from ACC guidelines uh, on HCM uh, from uh, 2011. And I'll show you how the definition definition changes um, between the two societies um, of what they consider as um, important uh, categories of uh, gradient. So um, to make the diagnosis, um, different imaging techniques have been utilized, but I think that the most common one um, that we start with obviously is uh, EKG. Um, there are uh, classic findings on the EKG um, that we see. Um, in addition, there is uh, echo, MRI, halter monitoring, and treadmill uh, exercise uh, testing. Since it's, it's an exhaustive list, what I have tried to do is I've included cases. I have included three uh, different cases um, that kind of uh, show different types of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And we'll show you all this imaging um, along with those cases so that probably you can understand better. And we will talk about um, a few of the other things, uh, particularly when it comes to the risk profile with sudden cardiac death, um, as well as how the guidelines guide us um, on these important topics. So if we look at um, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, the, uh, the phenomena um, that causes the obstruction is this uh, uh, systolic um, uh, anterior motion of the mitral valve, also known as um, SAM, um, S-A-M. Um, so what it is, is basically due to the uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, there is venturi phenomena by which the mitral valve gets sucked into this, uh, um, this cavity right here in the LVOT and uh, by which uh, it exacerbates the um, overall obstruction. Um, so let's talk about a case since now we have some idea on um, uh, what we do in these cases and how the echo may look like. So, um, so this case is of a 35-year-old male um, that presented with uh, abdominal pain, anorexia, nausea, vomiting. I had diagnosis of cholecystitis. <clears throat> Um, undergoes the surgery, post-operatively develops the tachycardia and tachypnea, and the EKG was done. 
And you can see for a 35-year-old male, he has extensive ST um, depressions uh, from V3 to V6. The voltage of the EKG is quite increased. Similarly, there are some Q waves uh, that are present in the inferior leads right here, as well as some ST changes um, in the lead two and the lateral pattern. So it's quite abnormal EKG. And this EKG would uh, alarm anyone and should alarm anyone um, because it's uh, quite abnormal um, for a patient who's 35 years old and without any known history of hypertension. So this is the echocardiogram of this patient. So again, um, you can see quite a bit of uh, LVH, left ventricular hypertrophy. So for the um, internal medicine trainees, so this is, um, this is called the parasternal long axis view on the echocardiogram. And uh, right here is the probe and the anterior most structure in the heart is the right ventricle. So this is the right ventricle. This is the ventricular septum. This is the left ventricle, left atrium, aorta. Here is the aortic valve, and this is the mitral valve. So let's play it one more time. So you can see that there is quite a bit thickness of left ventricular septum. It's, uh, it's in asymmetric fashion, and um, this is the mitral valve. And you can see that there is SAM, a systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve, which kind of um, touches this, um, this thickest portion of the ventricle. So this is another picture. So here you can see that um, again on color, um, you have this, um, th there is a mild SAM, systolic and anterior motion of the mitral valve. And there is some ex acceleration of the flow, um, the red flow that you are able to see right here. So once we see this, um, you know, we obviously uh, try to see uh, how it looks on the short axis. So again, um, it's the same kind of um, left ventricular hypertrophy on the short axis. And this is the classic four chamber view on the echocardiogram. So this is your left ventricle. This is your right ventricle, left atrium and right atrium. And again, you can see that there is significant hypertrophy as well as there is some brightening of the ventricular septum going all the way quite thick, um, you know, even in the apical area. So then the second step, as I mentioned, was once we um, identify there is left ventricular hypertrophy, the second step is really to see if there is um, any obstruction um, that exists. Uh, along with this, we, um, we uh, try to see if we can get uh, more hemodynamic Def, uh, hemodynamic data on the patient by doing uh, different Doppler flow across the um, uh, across the valve. So these are um, some of the Doppler um, uh, tissue wave Dopplers as well as the uh, pulmonary vein Doppler, which suggest um, the um, left atrial uh, pressure in this particular patient. So again, coming back to guidelines. So again, this is the European Society of Cardiology. So I showed you the American Society of Cardiology and how they, um, how they define um, the LVOT obstruction and the definition of obstructive versus non-obstructive. When we look at the European Society of Cardiology, um, if the patient is maximally, patient has maximally provoked provoked um, LV or, uh, LVOT obstruction more than 50 millimeters of mercury, um, they suggest that we treat the left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. But if the provoked peak uh, LVOT obstruction is less than 50, um, then they suggest that we just repeat the echocardiography at one year. If the patient is symptomatic, um, do the exercise stress um, uh, echocardiography and again, try to provoke these um, gradients. So after this, this patient underwent the treadmill uh, stress testing um, as well as uh, Holter monitoring. Uh, there were two episodes of non-sustained VT noted on the Holter and um, on uh, and and uh, on treadmill, even uh, with a provoked uh, gradient, uh, the peak gradient was 15. Um, you can see here that the maximal LV, LV vault 
septal wall thickness was 2.1 and it was asymmetric. The LV mass was increased. Um, so why all these features matter is because um, this is where the guidelines come into play on uh, ICD implantation and deciding the risk of sudden cardiac death, which is the which is a big topic uh, on itself, uh, but I'll try to walk you through that. So let's look at the MRI. So again, this is the short axis cut of the MRI. And this is basically, if you cut the LV left ventricle as a potato, um, you can see um, uh, the left ventricular myocardial deposition as it's coming up and you can see that it's a quite uh, thickened muscle um, in this area in the, uh, the uh, mid-LV right here. So then going to the other um, images on cardiac MRI. I guess it's, uh, okay. So this is another image, sorry for the choppy image, um, but basically again, you can see that distribution of the left ventricular hypertrophy. And um, this is uh, what we call the delayed enhancement imaging. So what we do during delayed enhancement imaging is uh, inject the C, uh, MRI contrast called gadolinium and uh, try to image the heart um, after giving the gadolinium. And the properties of gadolinium is that um, it is taken up uh, mostly by the um, uh, scar tissue in the heart. So uh, in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we know that because of this myocardial disarray, there can be fibrosis that is present in the heart. And hence you can see uh, typically there should, the entire myocardium should be dark um, like uh, these areas, the dark areas in the myocardium. So this is the LV again cut in the short axis. This is the LV in the four chamber view. This is the a ventricular septum. Right here is the ventricular septum. And you can see that all this patchy white areas, here also, patchy white areas, they, represented, they represent the late gadolinium um, enhancement in this patient, suggesting that he has extensive scar burden. Now, how does scar matter? Scar may be responsible for ventricular tachycardia in these patients, and scar is probably how um, we explain why these patients die of sudden cardiac death, because they may have significant amount of scar. Now, when evaluating SCAR uh, on MRI, uh, there are a few caveats that will come, which I will explain further. Um, but um, in general, um, this patient had 22% of the uh, myocardium that was scar which is quite significant, and I'll show you some data. So if we look at MRI, looking at the MRI, these are the main um, CMR phenotypes. So you have uh, the basal septal. Now this one is subtle, but this is a true hypertrophic cardiomyopathy case. Uh, this is the reverse scale, probably the one we just saw. Um, <clears throat> this is the apical um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We have an example coming, but basically the apex of the heart is thickened. Then you have the concentric um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy right here. Then you have the mid cavity where the mid cavity is quite um, thickened uh, and there is uh, apical um, aneurysm uh, developed distally. And then you have the lateral hypertrophic cardiomyopathy where the lateral myocardium is thickened. So these are the most common CMR phenotypes um, uh, that, uh, uh, that has been seen. So why do we have to do CMR in these cases of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? So I think that obviously when, whenever the echo images are uh, suboptimal to confirm the diagnosis, um, and uh, particularly when the diagnosis is suspected from the family history, medical history, EKG, and other imaging findings, um, I showed you that first table and showed you how many types of uh, LVH can exist and how it is so important to differentiate uh, different phenotypes uh, of LVH and identify which actually is truly hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and um, not the other ones. 
um, also to evaluate for obstructive as well as non-obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. In obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, CMR helps us identify where exactly the obstruction is. And this, particularly if the patient is going for the um, a surgical treatment, it's so important to identify where exactly the obstruction is so that the surgeon can um, exactly uh, take care of the problem. Um, uh, to evaluate the extent as the severity of the late gadolinium enhancement, particularly as I'm going to show you some data suggesting the prognostic implication of these findings. Um, obviously, to evaluate the burnt out hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and again give patient that prognostic um, uh, data. Um, so these are uh, one of your teaching moments, again, that I want um, probably the trainees to remember for the boards, etc. cetera. It's, um, uh, cardiac MRI um, is very important. So this is just an example of uh, how the echo blind areas can exist. So by echocardiography, we can completely um, either uh, um, either not identify the disease, underestimate the extent of the severity, or maybe in some cases overestimate it. And I have some examples coming up. Um, but basically, uh, if we look at this example, um, Dr. Meron is very well published in this field, and this is from one of his, um, uh, one of his papers. So in this case, um, uh, this posterior thickness of the septum was not identified on the echo um, due to suboptimal imaging. Um, in this case right here, there is extensive delayed enhancement as all this patchy white areas, as you can see, and this changed uh, patient's um, uh, overall planning. In this case, it was the lateral uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And as you can see how eccentric it is, and sometimes depending on the echo cuts, um, you can completely miss this. Um, in this case, it was important to see how this um, uh, the uh, the um, subaortic obstruction was happening in these uh, patients. So it's right here where the LVH is, and um, um, here is the thickened uh, um, uh, mitral wall leaflet as well as the direct insertion of the papillary muscle. This is an example of that mid cavitary obstruction and the apical aneurysm, which was missed on the echo. And again, because um, sometimes it's just difficult to um, see these apical aneurysms on the echo, depending on um, you know if you are foreshortened on echo. Um, and this is a case um, from a patient who was uh, who had a genetic um, a mutation present and the echo was negative, but then on MRI, you were able to identify these LV crypts. And these are basically indentations into the um, left ventricular myocardium and more than three have been associated with the phenotype of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, and again, this was uh, considered as a genotype genotype positive, phenotype positive patient because of identification of the LV crypts. So just a few examples where MRI can be helpful. Now, this is another one of your teaching moments. This is probably asked on all the boards across the world. So um, why is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy um, so important to diagnose? It's because it's prediction, a prediction to cause sudden cardiac death. And um, I showed you why it causes sudden cardiac death. Um, and there is uh, obstruction, um, and then there is fibrosis of the LVH, um, and then different um, different um, societies have come up with different guidelines. But if you look at the class one guidelines, if someone has a history of ventricular fibrillation, sustained uh, ventricular tachycardia, or history of sudden cardiac death uh, with the diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, um, you should put an uh, implantable, um, um, sorry, uh, ICD, the defibrillator in these patients. If someone has a family history of sudden cardiac death with the diagnosis and genotype positive, again, consider that unexplained syncope, um, the non-sustained VT, which is defined at three or more beats, uh, more than uh, 120 uh, beats per minute, um, and the maximal wall, LV, LV wall thickness of more than 30 um, mm. Now, this criteria is very important because depending on who is measuring what, uh, this actually uh, is a very important criteria to identify correctly so that um, we can give um, patients uh, correct uh, treatment as well as protect them. 
class 2a indication the blood pressure response during exercise so drop of 20 um, millimeters of mercury or failure to increase uh, the uh, uh, blood pressure um, and then class 2b is the cmr imaging with late gadolinium enhancement um, the double or compound mutation of genetic testing and the lbot obstruction so typically to be is um, a class one and two a are what is considered and you can see that in spite of um, what I showed you the CMR is considered as class two b indication and um, we, we think that given the data that has come out since these guidelines were published this probably will change in the incoming new guidelines so if we look at a patient that presents with a prior uh, cardiac arrest or sustained VT along with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy imaging features, then clear cut ICD is recommended. It's a class one indication. Um, if someone has family history of uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in the first degree relative, the uh, LV wall thickness is more than three centimeter or has recent uh, unexplained syncope, one can say that ICD is reasonable. And then going down further, um, you know, say, patients don't have this and this, then you're going to look for non-sustained VT and uh, abnormal blood pressure response. And this is when you need to look at these modifiers. So um, the modifiers being uh, the CMR, the genetic mutation, and uh, the severity of obstruction, and see if the ICD can be useful or not. Um, so I think this is what currently um, the guidelines recommend. So the European uh, Society of Cardiology, they came up with the Euro risk score, and this was published in 2014, um, the last HCM guidelines published by the society. And they basically, rather than going through these criteria, uh, what they did was they came up with um, a risk score that one can calculate and decide if the patient has low, intermediate, or uh, high risk. And in this, they, uh, they um, included age, and they obviously included the first degree relative, uh, the sudden cardiac death history in first degree relative, the maximal wall thickness, again, a very important feature, and I'll tell you why the left atrial diameter, the maximal uh, LV outflow obstruction at rest as well as well salva, the non-sustained VT, again, more than three consecutive ventricular beats of uh, more than 120, history of unexplained syncope. And based on this, they came up with the score, which I will show you right here. So this is a very complex score. You can calculate it. Um, you can plug in all the numbers and then, um, and then you can decide whether the patient is low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk for getting sudden cardiac death. And depending on this, you can decide the further management. Now, experts have criticized this score, uh, particularly for these features. Um, so we know that um, um, uh, the left atrial diameter, um, as well as the outflow track uh, gradient, or um, uh, you know the, these two features um, are not um, um, they they are not the studies have not shown a very strong correlation direct correlation with sudden cardiac death. Now they are associated with uh, um, the terminal type of HCM or more comorbidities that are um, more morbidities that are associated with HCM. But when it comes to sudden cardiac death risk. Um, it has not been associated directly, and hence the experts have criticized inclusion of these two criteria. Um, but the good thing about uh, this risk score is that they included age, which is such an important factor, as well as um, they took the maximal LB thickness as more of a linear uh, factor rather than just giving us a cutoff of three um, centimeters. Um, and uh, um, so I think uh, there are uh, there are criticisms as well as good things about this score. Um, we routinely use this in our patients. So now, um, since both the guidelines put so much emphasis on LV wall thickness and decision to put an ICD on LV wall thickness, I think that it's important to realize that the imaging modalities may have some 
um, shortcomings on this. So there are papers published on this um, and um, echoes sometimes can um, um, overestimate or underestimate the LV wall thickness. And in this particular study, almost 92% of the patient um, echo underestimated or overestimated uh, um, the left ventricular hypertrophy. So I'll show you the examples. And the most common um, mistake that is done uh, is probably by um, including this uh, septomarginal uh, band or the moderator band insertion on the left ventricle. So now on CMR, you can see that uh, by these stars, you can see very well where exactly this uh, band inserts. So in this patient that we had earlier seen, um, this whole uh, part is probably part of RB and should not be included in the LV wall thickness. But depending on what is included, you can definitely make mistakes. Um, uh, so these are some other examples. And again, you can see that in some patients, um, depending on the image quality, if you're off axis, you may overestimate or underestimate um, the LV wall thickness. Another example of uh, if you include the RV trabeculation, you can falsely increase the LV wall thickness. And why this is important is because this is how you're gonna make decisions, particularly the decision to put ICD. So this is very important for a patient. It may be just a measurement for us, but uh, for a patient getting a device in which is gonna stay with them for entire life, this is a very important consideration. So I want you to take um, um, this measurement uh, pretty uh, seriously and see where exactly you measure this. Um, and again, um, you know, because of, again, the uh, ultrasound um, um, uh, characteristics, sometimes there can be inclusion of the LV uh, trabeculation or um, and the mid cavitary um, hypertrophy can be missed. And again, this can be overcome by using the LV contrast. Um, and some more example where a focal hypertrophy cannot, may not be seen, or there may be poor definition of where exactly to measure. But nonetheless, echocardiography is the most commonly used modality um, across the world. And this is probably where our evaluation starts. But I think that it's important to realize um, the shortcomings of each and every modality and see what may be the next step uh, for you to navigate uh, the, clinical, um, um, the clinical course as well as the treatment options and diagnosis for that particular patient. So the late gadolinium enhancement is that patchy area uh, that I had shown you on. Um, the presence of late gadolinium enhancement, 50% um, of the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients have late gadolinium enhancement. Does that mean that all 50% need ICD? I don't think so. so. There have been studies done where um, it has been shown that what matters is uh, late gadolinium en enhancement more than 15% of the total uh, left ventricular myocardial and uh, um, the other feature from this uh, very impactful study was also that uh, um, both patients with obstructive as well as non-obstructive physiology uh, both had a similar uh, risk um, in the worse outcomes. Um, so this is another paper. So you can see that um, the late gadolinium enhancement, uh, more than 15% as the um, late gadolinium enhancement percentage increases in the la left ventricle, uh, the risk of sudden cardiac death uh, increases. Now, other point that I wanted to make um, before going to other cases is that HCM some, sometimes can be um, confused with the athletic heart. Um, it's important to remember that athletic heart patients would have um, the history of intense workouts and then they particularly respond to the detraining. So once you tell them to stop exercising um, and detrain, they would, uh, remember, uh, they would uh, basically uh, come back, their LVH would come back um, um, or decrease. Um, also, we have other features like uh, bizarre EKG and all these uh, MRI findings, but on athletic heart, you would not see any scar tissue on MRI or, or the perfusion defects. Um, one more study just to highlight how important it is to um, 
you know, diagnose uh, non-obstructive or labile. So obstructive is obviously uh, important and figure out in figuring out particularly the treatment option. But as uh, the non-obstructive as well as labile also has been associated with quite bad um, cardiovascular outcomes. So you can see that all these patients had atrial fibrillation, heart failure, ventricular tachycardia, or ventricular fibrillation. Um, um, and hence, it's very important that we diagnose these patients um, correctly. So let's go to a case. So this is a patient, a 60-year-old male, um, had heart racing symptoms. Um, first uh, day uh, from the emergency room was discharged, um, has had some history of uh, stroke um, and hypertension. Um, comes back again uh, with wide complex tachycardia. So this was the EKG on the first time. You can see some T wave inversions again in these lateral leads right here also. Um, so T wave inversions in lateral leads and then comes back again uh, transferred for uh, STEMI um, given the VT that occurred along with um, chest pain and heart racing. So this was the VT. So you can see this is wide complex um, tachycardia. So this started on the um, halter and this is captured on the um, EKG. Um, cardiac catheterization was um, normal. And uh, you can see these um, um, features of, uh, this is the echocardiogram. So again, um, you can see that there is uh, some thickness in this part in the left ventricle. And then there is this outpouching or the ballooning um, of the apex of the heart. Um, and there is definitely some thickness right here. So we did the MRI. So on MRI, you can see this very clearly. So if when we looked at the, the, those phenotypes, um, this is the midventricular um, HCM with uh, apical ballooning. So again, you can see that right here, it's quite thick and then there is um, apical ballooning. So this is the aneurysm um, of the apex. <clears throat> Now, this is the gadolinium enhancement uh, sequence. So you basically give the MRI contrast agent gadolinium, and you can see that it's taken up, up by this entire apex. And these are the short axis imaging cutting the left ventricle like a potato. And you can see that the apex, again, is quite enhanced and has quite a bit of uh, fibrosis um, everywhere. So we can probably now put the two things together and think of where the ventricular tachycardia may be coming from. And this is what, so we took the patient to EP lab um, since um, patient was quite symptomatic. And uh, from the EP lab, these pictures are from my EP colleagues. Um, and you can see that the entire apex is where this ventricular tachycardia was coming from. And a patient, was, patient underwent ablation since that's where the ventricular tachycardia was met. So this was kind of a nice correlation of the MRI findings and showing the scar in the apex and then um, showing that's exactly where the ventricular tachycardia was coming from and ablating the patient. So when we look at the apical aneurysm, there are two complications that um, I probably want everyone to remember. So one is arrhythmic events due to the ventricular tachycardia, uh, <clears throat> and that's associated with the scarring or the fibrosis of the apex. And the second one is the thromboembolic events. So um, in these um, in this uh, right here in these cavities, the aneurysms, the clots can hide. And if the clot is not picked up um, and patient is not treated, uh, patient can suffer uh, uh, stroke-like symptoms. Um, in fact, we had a case similar to that where a patient had apical aneurysm but had not been treated with any anticoagulation and ended up suffering with a, a major CVA. So this is uh, our last case. And after that, just few slides on treatment and then I'll stop. So it's a 27 year old uh, male. Um, he came with a chest pain radiating to the jaw, had also had shortness of breath and syncope. So you can see that it's classic anginal chest pain. Um, has diagnosis of HCM since years and uh, status post ICD, 
his one of his main complaint was near syncopal episodes when straining for a uh, bowel moment. Um, he was on some medical therapy, metoprolol 50 milligrams twice a day. On transthoracic echocardiogram, his ventricular septum was 3.6 centimeters thick and the resting gradient was 40 mm of Hg uh, in spite of being on the um, metoprolol. So here, just really tiny troponin um, elevation. On ICD, there was no VT, just the sinus tachycardia. Given his severe symptoms, he was actually referred for myomectomy, and I just wanted to show you all uh, the pictures. So this is a TEE that's done at the time of the surgery. So again, you can see right here how thick the ventricular um, septum is. Um, and then uh, followed by the color. And this is that um, SAM that's happening at that level where the thick septum is. And um, you have the LVOT um, um, flow acceleration right here. Um, and also the eccentric mitral regurgitations, which would be quite common. And this is, again, the same patient in the, um, in, we are imaging them for, from stomach here. And uh, you can see that um, quite a bit of hypertrophy. So their um, gradient, peak gradient here, as you can see, it was 78 millimeters of mercury. So there was quite a bit of gradient um, across that um, LVOT. So this patient was taken for surgery and <clears throat> I hope you can appreciate this, but uh, right here, there is a chunk of uh, muscle that's kind of scooped out. Um, and uh, you can also see it right here. So that uh, this is after the surgery was performed to, um, since this patient had severe hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and the septum was so thick and he had such severe symptoms that it was thought that this was probably the way to go given the severity of symptoms. and. Um, it's so only 27 year old uh, with um, synco near syncope every time um, he tried to have bowel movement, which is uh, quite disabling. Um, so this is after the surgery and you can again see that uh, the gradient, uh, in spite of doing provocation with dobutamine, um, the gradient doesn't go up and you can see right here that that color acceleration is uh, minimal and patient had fantastic result. He's doing well. One important thing to realize is to, um, for the surgery is to figure out where exactly is the anomalous um, um, uh, insertion of the papillary muscle. So in this case, um, there is this anomalous insertion of the papillary muscle directly into the anterior micro leaflet. And um, this, this may be responsible for the obstruction. It's very important. Um, finding that we need to communicate uh, with the surgeons before a patient is taken for surgery. So, so the treatment, when we look at it, alcohol septal ablation and the myomectomy, um, these are offered mainly for the patients um, who have quite significant uh, symptoms in spite of um, uh, optimal medical therapy. Um, but the caveat is it's very important to get it done from an experienced operator, um, both for alcohol, sublation, uh, alcohol septal ablation as well as myomectomy, because these, these procedures require quite a bit of experience. Um, and um, for the optimal outcome, it's important to uh, send the patient to that center of excellence when, where these surgeries are done. So when we look at the treatment of the obstruction, obviously there is beta blocker, uh, verapamil, the calcium channel blocker, and disopyramide that can be associated, that can be used uh, with beta blocker and the calcium channel blocker. And in spite of doing this medical therapy, if the patient has persistent symptoms, that's when you think of going for invasive uh, therapy. And depending on where exactly the obstruction is and what are the other features um, that are present, particularly the mitral wall anatomy and the function, you'll decide whether the patient is a good candidate for um, alcohol septal ablation versus um, uh, surgery at the myomectomy. Um, it's again, I cannot emphasize enough that these, these procedures should be done at center of excellence. So uh, it's important to refer these patients. So the new drug on horizon, so Explorer HCM is the trial that, is, that was testing uh, Mava Kempton, 
Um, and this is a medicine that basically attenuates the hypercontractility of the entire muscle um, and uh, changes the course. And uh, this trial was started, um, and this was the original paper that was uh, um, that came out in circulation for the study design and rationale. And since then, um, the company that makes the medicine has announced that they have made all the primary as well as the secondary outcomes um, in this trial. So it's a quite um, exciting phase um, in, in uh, HCM treatment. Um, they also have um, some data uh, for a non-obstructive um, uh, uh, the non-obstructive HCM. So it's quite exciting uh, for these uh, HCM patients to see that there may be another option apart from just the beta blocker, calcium channel blocker, or going all the way for surgical or alcohol septal ablation. So this is my end slide. So I just wanted to um, give you all uh, take home points. So and this is again very, very much tested on the board. So hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the most common genetic disease of the heart. It's the most common uh, cause of sudden cardiac death um, in young athletes. Um, the definition, remember, it involves the LVH in any wall, um, more than a 15 mm. 30% uh, of these patients are non-obstructive. CMR is an important tool for uh, diagnosis. Um, 50% of the patients can have late gadolinium enhancement on cardiac MRI, but it's the quantification of late gadolinium enhancement more than 15% that matters. Uh, identify the guidelines for ICD implantation and its weakness when it comes to individual patient and remember all the treatment strategies, the different approaches and the new medicine on horizon. So with that, I um, thank you all and let me see. If there are thank, you. thank you so much for the excellent presentation, Dr. Parwani. I really enjoyed all the imaging as an aspiring radiologist myself. Dr. Rani unfortunately had to leave to the hospital for a procedure, but she wanted to thank you and congratulate you on your excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now our audience seems to have a couple of, of very good questions for you. Yeah, I can't see the question. Is there... Okay. I, I see that there are seven questions, but I'm unfortunately not able to see them. I can read the questions for you. So Summer Kimmershaw asks you, do you feel our radiologists and echocardiologists should work as a team to avoid missing out simple renal cysts, ADPKD, et cetera, diagnosis to prevent LVH? Absolutely, that's a, that's a great point. In fact, um, I wrote, uh, we wrote about this. I wrote, I was the first author in the paper on uh, radiology, cardiology collaboration. So for, I think, correct diagnosis um, um, in all these uh, patients is so important because the cardiologists come from the clinical uh, point of view and the radiologists have, um, you know, not only, um, they don't not, not only just know the anatomy and the physiology of uh, the heart, but the entire, um, you know, body. And it's just so important to put all these pieces uh, uh, together uh, to solve the puzzle. And that's a great, uh, great point. Um, and I have, I personally have seen these uh, cases where renal cyst can be missed which can be responsible for um, uncontrolled hypertension causing the LV. It's a great point. And, and Summer Kumarshaw also asked if he, if he can send you some, some cases to your email. Absolutely. My email is right there on this slide. So feel free to um, send. Um, I think that uh, probably use Google, um, um, Google, uh, G, uh, the, what is it called? Just send me attachments to whatever, uh, whatever. Yeah. Okay. Now, Bols Sowers asks, is, an, is MRI routine for all HCM patients? Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. So I think that so far, as I showed you, the guidelines don't recommend the MRI, and they say that it's a class 2B indication, but I think they say that for um, patients who do not have a clear-cut echocardiographic uh, picture. So if the patients don't have good windows, uh, you do the MRI. In our clinical practice in United States, I, I can tell you that since the guidelines have come, a lot of things have changed and we are realizing how important it is to quantify the uh, late gadolinium enhancement in this patient. So we routinely do MRI. 
um, I think that you'll realize that none of these, when you're, when you're in practice, none of these patients you know, shout that, okay, I follow this guideline or I follow that guideline. They always have this mixture of the clinical features we put, which put you in dilemma because you want to make the right decision for your patient. And hence, you want to accumulate the data from as many sources as you could so that you can make that right decision for the patient. So we routinely use MRI. And I can tell you most of the academic centers in the United States do MRI routinely. And uh, the places where the MRI cannot be done, they send the patients. Um, so I, I see quite a bit of outside patients where we do MRI. And I have a similar question regarding HCM diagnostic modalities. What role does nuclear medicine have for HCM diagnosis or monitoring as FDG PET, for example, has been recently used on, on a lot of cardiomyopathies such as cardiac sarcoid? So I think you are hitting the nail right with there, right? So I think that there are two important things with nuclear, nuclear medicine. So I'm a multimodality imager, and I actually had a case that I took out because we didn't have time. But I think that the number one aspect is important because most of these patients would have, um, you know, they, they would uh, have chest pain. And, um, you know, young patients, yet probably the, you know, the possibility of having coronary artery disease is low, but as they approach the middle age, it's so important to diagnose coronary artery disease. So SPECT perfusion or PET perfusion, it, it has its own role in diagnosing coronary artery disease. Probably the best way to diagnose since you cannot use the dobutamine echo or um, you know, to diagnose these patients for chest pain, particularly when they cannot exercise. So for stress testing, um, you know, nuclear, nuclear uh, medicine is very important for this, uh, SPECT perfusion or PET perfusion. But the second part you said is very important. So typically sarcoidosis would not cause the LBH. It causes LV dilatation. But then there are some patients where, you know, they may have hypertension and sarcoidosis together. So they may have some LBH where you are suspecting which cardiomyopathy this may be. So mm -hmm. this, these confusing uh, patients, I would say the first line, again, after echo, if you're confused which cardiomyopathy it is, it, it is, you would go with MRI. And if the MRI shows that there may be some features suggestive of sarcoidosis, you go for PET sarcoid study. Got it. Thank you very much for answering my question. Yes. Now, Enrique Mainero asks, do you recommend, it, do you recommend the use of MRI in the follow of patients to evaluate the function of the heart? Yeah, so that's a very important um, uh, question. So particularly in the patient that are genotype positive, initially the MRI may be, um, or the echo and MRI may be silent. So you have really strong family history. Um, your patient has genotype, um, but you know there is no phenotypic presentation on any of the imaging modalities to pick up you know, all those scripts and what I was showing you, the focal hypertrophic, hypertrophy, I think it's important to repeat the MRI every two years is what we recommend. There are no guidelines on this. And this is, again, you know, individual patient basis. You're taking care of the patient. Um, and I think in the follow-up, um, you know, initially, if you don't have any delayed enhancement on the MRI, on follow-up, if you get any delayed enhancement, again, your criteria uh, for ICD may change. Um, because we know that HCM, this, I, I actually uh, wanted to put this in the take-home points, but HCM is a progressive disease. And it's important to realize that, you know, point zero, if it is uh, negative, that doesn't mean that point one is going to be negative. Or, um, so whenever you have strong suspicion, you have to follow up uh, the patient every couple of years with the um, echo, MRI, and the other modalities to figure out if there is any VT or anything else. Okay, and he, also, and he also wanted to congratulate you. Excellent lecture, congratulations. Oh, thank you. I, I hope it made sense. It's sometimes difficult to uh, put everyone together, the internal medicine trainees, the cardiology trainees, as well as the radiology colleagues. Yeah. Benedicta Mutiara asks, how do you measure the percentage area of LGE in left ventricular wall? Do you use a software or measure it manually? Um, so yeah, we use a software. So there are um, different MRI softwares um, that uh, give you that capability of uh, doing it automatically or manually. 
Mm-hmm. So basically all it is, is that um, you can decide what the normal myocardium it and myocardium is and tell the software that this is the normal myocardium. And depending on the signal density, it will identify all the abnormal myocardium. Now, it's a great question. I'm so glad they asked. <clears throat> it's always important to check the contours that the software gives you and to figure out that they're not including the areas that really not matter and may be artifactual and then to modify themselves. And why it is important is again, you know, the clinical implication of every single small little detail that we have on imaging matters so much for an individual patient, right? Because you're gonna make the decision of ICD versus no ICD, which is a big deal for patients. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Jamal Hussein asks, is there any features of the tissue Doppler profile that are unique to HCM? So that's a great question. So I think that um, the tissue Doppler profile mainly, as I was showing you in that example, would be important to figure out um, the left atrial pressure and the overall hemodynamic associated with the uh, HCM heart, right? And, you know, I think that as you, ad- the, as the disease advances, you're going to have, um, you're going to have uh, more um, filling pressures in the heart. And um, that's, that's where it would matter. I think I had a slide on the strain pattern. So strain, a myocardial strain would be different. And this would matter particularly when you're trying to figure out whether this is an amyloid heart versus a HCM heart. If you apply that strain package and figure out what the strain of that heart is, um, that probably um, will help you make the diagnosis, particularly in the places where MRI is not available and you're relying on the echo predominantly to make your diagnosis. Okay, just two more questions. Amyloidosis, how to differentiate from HCM? Oh, wow. That's the lecture itself. Actually, I'm talking about cardiac amyloidosis. That's my next lecture (laughs) coming up. Uh, And I think I have some slides on this. Um, But I think that, you know, it's just last month, I have had two cases, both of them um, thought to be HCM ended up amyloidosis. Actually, one, one thought to be HCM ended up amyloidosis. Another one thought to be amyloidosis had extensive scar in the septum and ended up calling it HCM. So I think that there is so much phenotypical mixture. Um, as I said that, you know, I, uh, it's the overall picture of the heart. So you start with, you know, clinical features, the age of the patient, amyloidosis, particularly the senile one would be common in patients that are older. Um, you know, if you have any <clears throat> multiple myeloma, you'll have AL amyloidosis that's more common. Then you go to the EKG findings. So again, EKG in that lecture, I'm going to tell you all, but EKG, the small complexes are not present in every amyloid, but when they are present, you know that that's not HCM. HCM would never give you small complexes. Then you come to the echo, um, you look at the overall you know, uh, features of amyloidosis on the echo, you apply the strain, and then you go to MRI. If everything else has been still, you're not sure. And then MRI will tell you whether it is one versus other. So I think it's quite, it, you know, that, that's, a, that's a quite a big topic. And I think we'll talk more. Probably you need to attend my next lecture. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it myself. And, and last question. Thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. Is there any difference between CCB and beta blocker in the treatment of HCM? So I have not come come across any data on the efficacy of beta blocker versus calcium channel blockers personally. I think in most of the cases where it's that severe obstructive hypertrophy, we end up using both at some extent. Um, And then, you know, it's limited by the heart rate. So, you know, you'll always watch out for what the heart rate is when you're trying to optimize these medicines. So I think that I, I, I'm not aware of any particular efficacy on the um, you know, well-done research studies that I can quote here, um, but I can be wrong. I can get back to you on that. Okay, and for any other questions that you may have, you can send it to the email of Dr. Perwani, and you can see it in the slide. And thank you very much again, Dr. Perwani, for doing this, and we, I think we all look forward to your next presentation with us. Thank you thank so much, you. Dr. Rodriguez. Okay. Signing off. Yeah. Bye. Bye bye.
thanks everyone for joining us. I hope you can see us next time. You can join us next time and have a, have a good day.